Well, I want to thank uh, Pastor Carmen and, and First Lady Rose for, uh, for having us, inviting us, and I thank you for being here. And most of all, I thank the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. If you have a, your Bibles, uh, if you would stand with me, please, for in honor of God's Word. In 1 Samuel, chapter 27, Samuel 27, verses 1 and 2. Pastor, would you pray for the message, please? Amen. 1 Samuel 27, verses 1 and 2, the Word of God says, And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There should speedily, there, there, for me, excuse me, there is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. And David arose, and he passed over with the 600 men that were with him. Praise the Lord. God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. What I'd really like to focus on is the, is the anxiety that filled up in David's heart and in his mind. We know that uh, King Saul became, uh, King Saul was a nutcase. <laughs> he became a nutcase. And, and one time he was throwing a spear at David, and the next time he was calling for him to play soothing music, and then he'd get all in a rage again. You know how that whole count goes. And then he started hunting David down. And David started running for his life. And then, then Saul would try to woo him back. And as a matter of fact, in verse 25 of the previous chapter, uh, then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things, and, sh and also shalt thou prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. But Saul was a nutcase. One day he was, I love you, David. The next day I'm going to kill you. You don't know anybody like that? Huh? You don't know any nutcases? Come to broccoli. <laughs> but David built this anxiety, or this anxiety swelled up within David. He said, he said in his heart, David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. I, in other words, I, I just know, I know the day is going to come. The day's coming, I'm going to perish by the hand of Saul. It's, it's going to happen. The shoe is going to drop. Have you ever felt that way? It's going to drop. Huh? But you know that the thought of David's heart here at this time was a false thought. David's thought was a false thought. This, this anxiety that, that I'm going to perish at any time. Now, any day, I just know it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. That Saul's going to get me. And, and too often times, I I'll just pick on myself. There's been too many times in my life when I've had that false thought placed there by the enemy. Huh? Oh, I just know at any time now. I'm just not going to make it. I, 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 I just have that feeling. You ever say that? I just have that feeling? Huh? I have that feeling. I've learned something this past few years, and you know you're always learning. If you ever stop learning, if you ever think you've arrived, <laughs> yeah. 
But I have learned something this, this past few years. That the devil works in the realm of feelings. Whereas God works and moves in the realm of faith. Amen? The devil's always trying to stir up negative feelings. He works in the realm of negative feelings. Making you feel anxious. Making you feel, feel afraid. Making you feel uh, uh, sick. Making you feel bad. Making you feel paranoid. Making you feel nervous. Making you, making you feel shy. Making you, whatever you, you can put whatever you want in that blank. If it's a negative emotion, negative feeling, it's coming from the enemy. He places false thoughts in your mind. Yeah, the, uh, Joyce Myers says that uh, she wrote a book, The Battlefield of the Mind, or the mind of the, is the battlefield, whatever, whichever way you say that. The battlefield of the mind, right? And that is the truth. This is where the battle is. It's in the mind because if, if he can change your mind, if the devil can sway your mind, and, and you know, we have, we have a body, uh, we're, we're, we have a soul, we have a spirit. You remember when God, God made a, a man? Now someone's saying, good grief, he's going from generation to <laughs> Genesis to Revelation. When God made man, made a body out of the dust and the, the dirt of the ground, right? And then he breathed into him the spirit of life. And then man became a living soul. Huh? And kind of neat that you're kind of you're a walking around trinity. But it, so the mind, and, and your mind is not your brain. Your mind is not your brain. Your brain is the, is the physical organ that 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 uh, controls bodily functions, huh? And 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 and, and, and makes makes your fingers do this and, and your toes do that, you know, and all this stuff. That's the brain. Keeps your elect, electrical. I'm not a medical person, but it keeps your heart beating, keeps your lungs going like this. Your brain keeps your body, but your mind is the head of your spiritual being. Your mind. You see, the Bible tells you to be uh, uh, not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Huh? The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Philippians, said, think on these things. Think on things that are good and pure. You know, uh, Philippians 4, verse, verse 8, think on things that are good and pure, of virtue, you know, of beauty. Uh, think on positive things, amen. Feed your mind on those things because that's what changes the rest of you. Because if the devil can sway your mind, then the rest of you goes with your mind. Your body will follow your mind. David had a false thought. He thought that at any time now, at any time now, any day, uh, Saul's going to get me. It's inevitable. And, and I, I'm learning not to prophesy such things over myself. Huh? Watch, be mindful of what you say. Be mindful of what comes out of here. The spoken word is powerful for good and for bad. Huh? The Bible tells us, I, I lay before you life and death. Choose life. David had a false thought. He had a false thought. Because he certainly had no grounds for thinking that God's anointing him by the prophet Samuel was intended to be left as an empty, unmeaning act. Huh? Remember that? When, when, when God was so displeased with King Saul, he, he called the prophet Samuel to his presence and said, Okay, Samuel, you go out and you find another man and I'll direct you and you will anoint him to be king. I'm done with Saul. Saul's days are numbered. David had a false thought and false anxiety. He was worried, he was worried about a man that, whose days were numbered. We often worry about an enemy who's already failed. We're worried about an enemy who's already lost. Huh? Hallelujah. Give God some praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God sent Samuel. He went to Jesse's house. Huh? When I hear that name Jesse, I think of the Dukes of Hazard. 
You know, Uncle Jesse in his bibs and long white beard. And, huh? Can you just see him? You can almost hear him, right? Uncle Jesse. Uh, I've come to see your sons. Now I'm giving you an ego paraphrase. That's all right, right? And so Jesse brought in, uh, ooh, Eliab. Eliab, he's, ooh, my oldest son, he's tall. He's strong. He's handsome. He looks like a king. He's got big shoulders. So he brought in Eliab. And Samuel looked at him, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to Samuel. So I said, no, that's not him. That's not him. Uh, you have another boy. So all oh, Jesse paraded all his sons before Samuel to find a new king. This is an exciting day. And, and none of them boys, no, no. When he got to the last one, he said, no, that's, that's not it. Do you have any others? Do you have any other boys? Come on. And Jesse said, well, as he pulled on his suspenders, on his bibs, <laughs> he said, well, there is one. But Mr. Samuel, you don't want to see him. He, he's but a ruddy boy. I, he's up on the back pasture tending my sheep. He's out there in the field. Uh, yeah, he's just a boy and not very impressive. You see, doesn't God always pick what we don't pick? Doesn't he always move in a way we wouldn't move? Huh? He always goes and picks someone. I'm in the ministry. You know he don't pick what man would pick. <laughs> so Jesse said, well, okay. And he sent somebody to go fetch David, and David come in from the fields. He's been with sheep. Have you ever been with sheep? I had an uncle that had sheep once. Not pleasant. They have an old war. You know. So here comes David, been with sheep, sleeping out there by the fire at night. And Samuel looks at David, and Jesse is like, oh boy, David. Well, there's, yeah, well, there's David. And the Spirit of the Lord just came all over that place. When he looked into that boy's eyes, he said, oh yeah, this is he. And he anointed David with oil. And it run down over David's head onto his shoulders, down his clothing. He anointed him in the name of the Lord to be the next king of Israel. Oh. I would have loved to have been in the corner, a mouse in the corner of that house and see Jesse's jaw go. Wow. Now, some time has passed and Saul is chasing and hunting David down and one time loving him, next time hating him, and now, but David's filled with this anxiety that I, just any day now I'm going to perish at the hand of Saul. And he has this false thought, and he dared to think, he dared to think that, that Samuel's anointing him to be king of Israel one day was an empty, unmeaning act. 21 years ago, God called this church into existence. God called a pastor and a pastor's wife. And the Holy Spirit hath called all of you here to be a body, to be this church. He called you into existence and he put his anointing on you. He put his anointing on you to be a local body representing his gospel in this place. For such a time as this, do you think that that was just a, a, a unmeaning, a, doesn't mean anything kind of thing for God to do? David had such a thought. There was never, 
not even one time, not even one occasion where the Lord deserted his servant. He had been placed in, in perilous situations. There's no doubt about that. David had been placed in perilous situations. He had been placed in hard positions often, and, 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 but not one instant, not for one instant had ever occurred in which divine intervention had ever left David but did not supply him a route of escape. Give God some glory for that. Now, now the, the trials, the troubles... You say, I've got troubles, I've got trials. Yes, you do. I don't know anyone that's not dealing with something. Even myself, even my wife, my family. We, have, we are all dealing with something. Huh? This is the nature of the world in which we are living in. Jesus himself said, this is a world of tribulation. In other words, this is whole, this a whole world of trouble. This is a world of trouble under the curse of the law of sin. It's, a, it's just a world of trouble. It's going to be that way until God redeems all of creation one day. Amen? But until then, this is a world of tribulation. So we all going to face something. Uh, if you're not having a problem right now, trial or trouble, huh? Oh, I'd like to see you get a little happy. If, if you're not having a problem right now, a trial or a trouble, uh, uh, wait. Yeah, because if one just if one just ended and you in a you in a calm spot right now, enjoy it. Because there's another one coming, huh? That's just so the nature of the beast here, huh? So so what what you do is you rest between the waves. <laughs> so if you're in a resting spot right now, thank God, huh? If you in the if you in the middle of a trouble, thank God because that problem's almost over. Uh, but 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 be prayerful because if you're in a prosperous, peaceful time, be much in prayer because there's one coming, huh? Do you know that's the danger spot when you're when everything's going good? Yep. Uh, everything okay? That's another. Woo. Praise the praise the Lord. But there was not one time. But, but, but the other half of what Jesus said, though, yes, this is a world of tribulation. But then he said, but be of good cheer. I, meaning him, he has overcome this world. Huh? What does that mean for you and I? Give him praise, yes. What, what does that mean? I have overcome. I have overcome this world. Whenever I think I have it, had it rough, I think of this. Think of this. I haven't had nothing like this. Huh? He hung there, suspended between earth and heaven, uh, for the first time, for the first time, he felt a separation between him and the Father. You know, now, the Father really never was any further away. But Jesus, tasting every drop of pain and despair and anguish, and more so than you and I will ever taste, he felt separated from the Father. Uh, for the first time, angels, who had always been there since the manger, always been there to, the, to be with him, to help him, to comfort him, to minister to him. They were there at the manger. They announced it to the shepherds. They, walked, they watched over him when he was a little boy. Could you, I wonder what it was like to grow up with Jesus. It would be fun, huh? He'd be, you'd be skipping along the road, and he'd see a dead bird. Oh, pick it up, and it flies away. <laughs> How, what would that be like? <sighs> a feather just landed on my... <sighs> Not really. <laughs> what would that be like, huh? But angels were always present. Except... That day. 
They stepped down. They were given an order, a command to step down. And he hung by himself. He cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's a world of tribulation. But then, as you know, on the resurrection morning, he came out of that tomb. Huh? Praise the Lord. He came out of the tomb. That makes our resurrection a sure fact. And then he could say with a lungs full of, of air that ain't been breathed before, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. I have overcome the world. David could not put his finger on any entry in his personal diary or personal journey or journal that, that would say, uh, here is evidence that the Lord has forsaken me all. But, but for the entire record of his past life, it proved the very opposite. God had never forsaken David from a boy. Helped him kill that bear. Huh? A bear come out to, to attack David. Jesse's sheep, and, and uh, God helped him kill that bear. God helped him kill the lion. He's just a boy. That's pretty good. Pretty good stuff. God helped him kill that lion. Protecting. You know what God was doing? David was in training for a bigger target. Huh? Remember when he finally did, when he finally did square off with, with Goliath in that valley? No one else had the courage. Uh, the army of the living God was hiding back in the edge of the woods. For days, old Goliath went out there and stood and made his boast. No one till David, little ruddy boy, five smooth stones, he only needed one. But he'd been practicing. Huh? God had never forsaken David. How could David entertain a thought? How could he entertain this thought that, uh, oh, I'm going to perish by the hand of this nutcase? That nutcase's days were limited. David's whole life was yet ahead of him. He yet had to reign as king. God had already anointed him to be king, and yet David thought this nutcase was going to take him out. Beloved. If the enemy could have taken you out, you'd all be gone now. You just missed your shouting moment. You'd all be gone right now if the enemy could take you out. Huh? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, he should have remembered. He should have remembered and should have uh, been able to testify of what God had done for him. Now, let's not be too hard on David because a little, little ways down the road, David recovers. And David starts to encourage himself in the Lord. Amen? So don't be too hard on David. But now, isn't that just the, in the same way that we doubt God's help? Now, don't be so critical on David because we have all done it. And, and I wonder how often God gets a... A little tired of his kids keep doing this. You know, they keep, keep doubting me. You know, I, I helped them there and helped them here and brought them to this very hour, and, 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 and they think still they're going to perish at the hand of the enemy whose days are numbered. There's a chain waiting for Lucifer. There's a chain waiting for that old devil. Huh? God's angel of glory is going to wrap it around him one day and Drag, he's going to be drugged down, thrown into the bottomless pit. His days are numbered, numbered, numbered. If you are a child of the living God today, you've got all eternity in front of you. Your, better, your best times is yet to come. Amen? <laughs> Don't ever entertain that false thought. I caught myself 
recently entertaining that false thought. Myself, that's what drives this home to me so dear and this message. If it ain't for you, I know it's for me. The enemy cannot take you out. God hath anointed you. God hath called you. Unless you be doing something stupid. Now, God does not always suspend the law of gravity. You know, sometimes he steps in and, and, and does, but, but, you know, oftentimes he doesn't suspend the law of gravity if you want to do something dumb. You take yourself out. And the devil will try to take credit for it, but it's all because you did something stupid. Huh? <laughs> I don't know how many of you remember the uh, gospel quartet called The Stamps and the bass singer J.D. Sumner. J.D. Sumner could sing, I think, an octave below a piano. He's in the, in the, in, in the world records book of the, as being the lowest bass. Uh, George Yance, now, now they're both with the Lord, but George Yance was the bass singer for the cathedrals. George was a fantastic singer. George used to tease uh, J.D. Sumner and say, you are the lowest bass, but you can't carry a tune. <laughs> you, you can't stay on a, a line of music. He said, J.D., you just could... You get down there like a... But you can't sing. And then, and then J.D., of course, J.D. was like this tall, and George Johnson was like this tall, and he would just slap George upside the head. But J.D. Sumner said, and I quote, this is a profound spiritual thing. And I want you to listen close. You might want to write this down in the margin of your Bible. J.D. said, you can be saved and be stupid. <laughs> he, said, he said, I know some. Saved, but stupid. Don't be stupid on the Lord now. Amen? Don't let the enemy fill your mind with a false thought, thinking that you are going to fall. He just would love you to think on that. Because if he can make you think that and make you keep start saying that, then somewhere soon, unless, unless you uh, let the Holy Ghost pop in somewhere and turn your mind around, it can become a, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. I know men that used to be in the ministry, men that preached like thunder. I'm telling you what, I, there, there have been ministers of the gospel with such anointing, they make preachers repent. And then you hear somewhere down the line, they've fallen away. They've fallen away. Huh? Because they entertain a false thought from the enemy. And they sealed their own doom. God had never forsaken them. But they sealed their own fate. And this is just the same way that we at times have dealt at God's help. It, it is not mistrust. Well, excuse me, I said that wrong. It is mistrust without a cause. We mistrust the Lord without a cause. He's been so good to us. And then when we doubt him, when we, when we dare to, to accuse him uh, that, he's, that he's not going to help us, that he's going to just leave us drowned in our sorrow, in our misery, and in our woes, and we think, oh, what was me? This time I'm done. I'm done. That is like just spitting in his face. We are mistrusting him without a cause. I, I, I'm a full-time chaplain at the Dubois Hospital, and the majority of my time is spent. I'm a chaplain throughout the whole hospital system. I hope I'm not on call tonight. Um, no, that was last night. But... But well, most of my time is spent with our, our, our cancer center and our hospice program. I have met the most courageous, bravest people in that cancer center. 
and in hospice. When they're, and I, it's a sacred time to be with these people at the end of their life, just when they're ready to step across that threshold. That's a sacred time. But this one little lady, uh, one day she was receiving chemotherapy. She's hooked up to an IV, uh, hanging on a, a pole next to her chair. And a little frail lady, uh, she looked like she'd been uh, drug over 100 miles, a real bad road. She had her little knitted hat on her head because there was no hair. And, and her veins was, was, you could see every vein in her little thin arms and hands. I sat down in a chair next to her and I took her by the hand. I didn't know quite what to say. And I said, is, is there anything I can do for you? She smiled at me, the sweetest smile. And she said, Chaplain, that's all right. That's all right. God's already done it. She said that the Lord who brought her through all, and I've remembered this, I, I've used it now lots of times, the Lord who brought her through all her yesterdays is well able to take me through all of my tomorrows and he holds me in this present day. Chaplain, it's all right. God hath never forsaken me. Huh? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God has never forsaken you. He always has been there. Always makes a way. Don't mistrust him without a cause. Ha have we ever had, have we, have we ever had the shadow of reason to doubt our Father's goodness? Now just think about it. Have we ever really? Uh, have, have not his loving kindnesses been marvelous to you and to me? He has, uh, has he one time, has he ever once failed to justify our trust in him? Or, or our God has never left us at any time. We have had dark nights, that's true. But, you know, in, in our dark nights, the star of love has shone forth in the middle of the blackness. You see, that's when his stars shine brightest, when it's the darkest. We have been in, in, in stern conflicts. We have, we've been in, 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 in serious conflicts. But over our head, he has held a shield of our We have gone through many trials. We, we could spend all night and tomorrow and not cover all the trials if we all took our turn. We've been through many trials, but never to our detriment. Never. Always to our advantage. And the conclusion from our past experience is that he who has been with us in six troubles will not forsake us in the seventh. Huh? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Apostle Paul, under, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, um, he penned these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. We are troubled on every side. There's nothing easy about what you're doing here. There is nothing easy. But God doesn't call and anoint champions and kings and priests to do something easy. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not 
destroyed. Praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. George Foreman, long time ago, was facing Muhammad Ali in what is now gone down in history as the rumble in the jungle. I, I was a boy, but I watched it. See, my dad was a former amateur boxer, so we kind of like that stuff. George Foreman, in his prime, I, even now, I wouldn't crawl in a ring with George. I'm just glad he's my brother in the Lord. I wouldn't get in with him now. But in his prime, he was an unstoppable machine. I mean, he had arms like pythons. You remember, those of you remember him. And he squared off with Muhammad Ali, who, was so, who had been the former champion, uh, was thought to be a little bit past his prime. Mm, 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 mm. And George got in that ring with Muhammad Ali. The rumble in the jungle. And was it Zaire, Africa, I believe. And he clocked Ali. Now, I want you to know that no one up to this point, no one ever, ever, ever hit Muhammad Ali's face. He had the prettiest face in boxing. And he had the fastest feet. No one could touch him. <laughs> no one could touch him. I flew like a butterfly. I sting like a bee. <laughs> hey, George, you don't want to mess with me. Huh? Woo! No one touched But George hit him right in the face. No one had ever done that. I mean, bam! He clocked him with that mighty python of an arm, and Ali went back against the ropes. And George was thinking, it's mine now. <laughs> but funny thing happened. Ali came off the rope. George pushed him back on the rope. Ali come off the rope. George push him back on the rope. Ali come off the rope. And, and, and there comes the expression called the rope-a-dope. You see, what George didn't know, Ali was using the ropes like, like, like a, a shock absorber. Thank you, David. It's like a shock absorber. He was taking the shock. It wasn't really. He was taking. George, is, he's swinging. He's, then, then he starts to swing wild. And he can't get him. Well, we know Ali won the fight. Pressed down. Not destroyed. Hmm? You can knock me down. But weebles wobble. <laughs> and they don't fall down. Bumbles bounce. So the enemy can bounce you. But you coming back up. Huh? He bowed you, but you coming back up. Troubled on every side, but not distressed. Persecuted or perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not destroyed. Cast down, but not out. Huh? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What? we have known of our faithful God proves that he will keep us to the end. Amen? Give him praise. Would you stand with me? Let us not, let us not nor ever reason contrary to the truth of what we know. Don't let the devil lead you in a false thought 
that would make you believe something contrary than what you know is the truth about the God that has saved you, that has washed you, that has separated your sins from you, that has made you a new creature, given you a new life, put his Holy Spirit in you, put his breath of eternal life already in you, has never left you, brought you through your yesterdays, intends to take you through all of your tomorrows until you can be with him and he holds you in this present day. Don't ever, ever entertain a thought contrary to the truth of what you know about our Lord. How can we ever be so ungenerous as to doubt our God now? Old gospel songwriter said, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. No, for the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. The God of the good times is still God in the bad times. He's going to bring you through. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you bow your heads, please? Lord, I pray that we will throw down that Jezebel of our unbelief. And I pray that the dogs will, will devour it. That unbelief will be just stricken from our hearts and minds. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over this precious pastor and his wife, over this church family, Lord God. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ right now over them. May they always know that your hand is upon them. May they know that your presence is with them. May they know that you are before them, behind them, either side of them, that you give your angels charge over them to keep them in all their ways. That you have not called them and brought them forth to this day just to leave them now. That, that you have not called this church and over 20 years to your testimony to, to let the devil run it out now. We rebuke that Jezebel of unbelief. And we thank you, our matchless, unchanging God of glory. Praise the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor.